So now we have the first panel of uh, our uh, council on the presentation of the World Migration Report 2020. You have the report in a USB key that has been uh, uh, distributed. It's currently available in English and key chapters are also available in Spanish. Uh, both the full English report and the Spanish chapters are on the USB and work is currently underway on the French translation. So we will end up with the translation in all uh, languages. I want to start by thanking the presence of the uh, panelists. And I would uh, emphasize that this report is, is now f published for uh, 20 years. It's the 10th edition. It corresponds to a key concern of us that uh, we should provide to the, our member states, to the international community, to the academic world, to the press, to the public at large, uh, the best uh, evidence we collect and the re reflection on the evidence that we collect. That's why the report is here as two parts. The first part is very much evidence-based focus to provide the basic elements uh, of the evidence and the data that we collect. And the second part, uh, which will focus on a number of uh, dynamics and uh, key trends in the evolution of uh, mi migration worldwide. So in this respect, we have, it's different from the past, where there was a, a certain thematic uh, focus. We try to, this time, to bring you first a, a, a picture, a landscape, with the data, and then secondly, picking up some of the key elements for, ref for further uh, reflection. And we want, uh, uh, I will present uh, the panelists uh, now following this very brief presentation. We are pleased and honored to have Ambassador Doreen de Brum, permanent representative of the Marshall Islands to the United Nations in Geneva. Ambassador Michael von Umberg Sternberg, the permanent representative uh, of Germany to the United Nations today with us in this panel. panel and uh, we will uh, afterwards ask the, uh, the Mary McAuliffe, the head of Migration Research Division at IOM and co-editor of the World Migration Report to come in, and also Mr. Binod Kadria, professor of Economics and Education at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi to their, their contribution, to give their contribution. So we uh, come to the point where I am giving the floor to the ambassador, permanent representative of the Marshall uh, uh, Islands. Uh, you, you speak first, okay, very well. You see our director general is disciplined. Uh, when he makes a mistake, the services are there to correct him. So go ahead, Mary. Thank you so much indeed, um, director general. And thank you very much for your warm welcome. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just, uh, uh, Professor Kadri and I will just provide a very brief overview. Uh, and then uh, we are delighted to actually have Ambassador de Brom and Ambassador von Unberg Sternberg to really make some remarks uh, as member states and supporters of the World Migration Report. So let me please just start by saying it's a privilege to be here and to be addressing the 110th session of IOM Council on the new World Migration Report. We wish to thank the Director General and IOM senior management team for their leadership of this body of work and for their strong support of and very strong commitment to building the evidence base on migration as a means to inform effective policy and practice. We would also like to thank the many migration practitioners and the scholars and many, many IOM colleagues who've contributed to the final report. It's a highly collaborative process and we're grateful for their engagement and their expertise and for their support. As the Director General said, when we revised the World Migration Report series in late 2016, ahead of the 2018 edition, we had in mind a redesign that would see the flagship report become a practical global reference report, a true world migration report, one that is able to provide global and regional trends using the latest data, the latest information and empirical analysis, and relevant to readers regardless of whether they are reading the report in Ottawa, 
or Accra or Lima or Helsinki or Apia or Bishkek or anywhere else in the world. We were also intent on providing a report that could be used by people working on migration, as well as studying migration and reporting on migration, a particularly important element. To achieve this, we knew that we needed to ensure that the content of the report is accessible, that it's accurate and rigorous, and we drew upon our partners to help us support us in this endeavour. And as shown in this summary of the approach, Thank you. Here we are. Uh, and as shown in this summary of this approach, uh, the World Migration Report has really stepped up its contribution to the understanding of migration globally. In addition to drawing upon our long-term and valued partners, we focused on providing a strategic contribution to building the evidence base on migration for a growing readership. We lifted our own expectations of the flagship and I'm pleased to say that the revised World Migration Report has been well received by government officials, by academics, by students, and the broader public. Today, in launching the World Migration Report 2020, Professor Kadri and I will provide a brief overview of the contents. I'll focus on part one, and Professor Kadri will take us briefly through part two. There we are, there's part one and part two, the table of contents. Part one provides an analysis of key data and information on migration and migrants, both at the regional level and by the global overview. Part two of the report is thematic in nature, as you can see. It focuses on complex and emerging migration issues. And part two, the chapters change from report to report. So we've built the World Migration Report series for at least the next decade and perhaps longer. The lead thematic chapter in this World Migration Report examines the topic of migration, uh, migrants' contributions in an era of increasing disruption and disinformation, something that we all have to face in our daily lives. Other salient topics, as you can see, include human mobility and adaptation to environmental change, children and unsafe migration, and inclusion and social cohesion. Chapter two, the global overview, provides a really big picture look at migration. It looks specifically at migration and migrants, and it offers us a synthesis of some of the big elements in regards to global data on migrants, as well as migration flows. It provides an overview of current data and trends on migrant workers, on international remittances, refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, and this year we've also added stateless persons. To supplement this discussion, data on IOM's programmatic and operational work has been provided, including, for example, on resettlement and on assisted voluntary return and reintegration. And while we acknowledge that this programmatic and operational data does not claim to be global in nature nor representative, it does help to illustrate key aspects of how this work relates to migration more generally. In chapter three, regional dimensions and developments, a very substantial part of the report uh, these days, looks particularly at regional dimensions. We know that this is particularly important, including in relation to geography, but also in relation to the international cooperation, for example. We provide key migration statistics at the regional level with sections on the UN regions, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, Northern America and Oceania and then narrative descriptions of key features and recent developments are provided at the sub-regional level, including on a range of relevant issues, such as we've heard in general debate today and also yesterday. Labor migration, displacement, migrant smuggling and trafficking. Together, the presentation of statistical data and the descriptive narr narratives allow readers to quickly grasp some of the key regional dimensions of migration and displacement. And I'll quickly show you just some of how we use data to show patterns, trends, and differences across different regions. We've spent quite a bit of time designing original graphs in collaboration with the world's leading migration data specialists that draw upon the latest migration data to show distinctive regional patterns and trends over time. They also show stark differences between regions, underscoring the very real need to take regional aspects into account when formulating policy as well as implementing international initiatives on migration, including the Global Compact. 
You can see here part, the part three figure on the left slide, which is of trends to Europe, within Europe and from Europe between 1990 and 2019, is quite different to the three part graph on the right hand side, which is of Latin America and the Caribbean, trends to, within and from Latin America. So it gives readers a very quick overview when you look across the six world regions of the very, very different patterns that are emerging over time on migration. We also use uh, data visually to illustrate complexity. So what I have here is uh, a figure on the top 10 African countries by total refugees and asylum seekers. And what this figure shows us is that we can see that some countries are origins of large numbers of refugees, while at the same time being hosts of large refugee populations. Overall, we've designed part one of the report to provide a useful reference on a range of aspects of migration, including so that people can learn about its global and regional dimensions and variations. Finally, very quickly, as the Director General mentioned yesterday in his report, we have moved from digital first to digital only for the This World Migration Report. There is no printed report. It's freely available online at IOM Bookstore. We've done this to ensure that it's environmentally friendly and also that it's cost efficient. It saves around one million pieces of paper uh, each edition. And I would just like to update you on the latest uh, download data that we have for the World Migration Report 2018, which shows that downloads are now over 460,000 globally. Uh, this compares to a hard copy distribution of the report of just 2,160 reports. So in total, that is 0.05 of the total distribution was done in hard copy last time. So we're able to save money and we're certainly able to save paper. We also produce USBs to assist with ICT connectivity where in areas where there are download issues. Please note that in translating uh, of the report continues and in your USB there's the full English report and several chapters, but I'm very pleased to let you know that we have almost finished uh, the Spanish chapters with the, especially the regional chapter being made available only this morning thanks to the very significant efforts of the publications unit, both in Geneva and also in Manila. We also have material available now in French, the French information sheets, but let me reassure you that translation continues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary. Well, in, in, in fact, the World Migration Report 2018 is the most downloaded publication of IOM, definitely, with the figures that you have mentioned. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Binod Kadri. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you, Director General, and uh, thank you, Dr. McAuliffe. I join you in acknowledging the Director General once again and all others that you have mentioned to have graciously contributed to this 2020 edition of the World Migration Report. I also acknowledge the IOM personally for having invited me to be the co-editor with Dr. McAuliffe in this venture, which I thoroughly enjoyed and benefited from. Having said this, let me take you, the esteemed member states, through what I might call just the tip of an overview of part two of the report. It contains seven chapters, chapter five to chapter 11, on themes handpicked to reflect today's frontier concerns within the migration discourse across the world. As you would notice, each of the seven chapters has been written by teams of two or three migration scholars from various parts of the world, both the global south and the global north. What is common to these seven chapters is that all of them have deliberated upon two things. One, implications for policies and practices, and two, implications for further research, particularly in the face of the growing disruption and disinformation that has been mentioned. So I take you through the slides and uh, we have, uh, in terms of individual chapters, uh, each of the chapters, the first thematic chapter, as uh, Mary, Dr. Mary McLaugh has already mentioned, is about migrants' contributions to the countries of destination and countries of origin. This is not about, I 
would like to emphasize this is not about the stereotypical cost-benefit analysis of migration that has, so to say, plagued the migration literature for a long time without yielding much operational outcome. Instead, this is about putting the core stakeholder in migration, namely the migrant and the migrant's family at the center stage within the socio-cultural, civic, political, and economic life cycles of countries, something that should have happened a long time ago. This paradigm shift at this juncture of human history would hopefully inspire the readership constituency of this report to help the GCM achieve its broad objective of making migration safe, orderly, and regular with a long-awaited acknowledgement of the contributions that migrants make. Next chapter, uh, chapter six, deals with the important subject of inclusion and social cohesion. Starting with their definitions, it examines outcomes as well as obstacles and explores the ground situation faced by local actors as well as the migrants. And chapter seven, which is migration and health, um, it also deals with definitions and talks about the determinants of migrant health the vulnerabilities as well as resilience, the system's responses as well as governance of migration and health, key evidence gaps as well as investment in effective approaches. Chapter eight is on children in unsafe migration. It has charted out various ch types of child migration, their drivers and their trends reflected by data. The chapter particularly elaborates upon the protection challenges that affect child migrants and takes stock of progress and priorities that need attention. Chapter nine is on environmental, uh, chapter nine is on environment and uh, it deals with migration as an adaptation strategy to climate change. It provides empirical evidence with examples from across the world. We do not have time to go into the details, but this is, as I said, only tip of an overview. The next chapter, chapter 10, 10 is uh, the thematic chapter on migrants caught in crisis, both building upon MIKIC initiative to handle natural disasters and ma man-made conflicts. It examines the gaps as well as the lessons learned, both for crisis preparedness and post-crisis recovery. The chapter deals at length on issues related to data and discusses innovative responses for helping migrants caught in crisis. Next chapter is uh, on final and seventh chapter, seventh symmetric chapter, which is chapter 11, provides an analytical update on the global governance of migration since the last biennial World Migration Report of 2018 that Dr. McAuliffe had just mentioned. It walks us, this chapter walks us through the range of developments, the SDGs and the two compacts, the GCM and the GCR, and their complementarity, coherence, as also the gaps between them. As a concluding chapter of part two of the new 2020 World Migration Report, it thus works as the umbilical cord between the two reports, the 2018 and 2020, linking two together. As an academic and the co-editor of the World Migration Report 2020, I am not merely hopeful. I expect that the two parts, part one, on the empirical scenarios of the world and its regions, and part two, on the analysis of the select themes, would provide the balance the flagship publication ought to have. The litmus test of how far we have actually succeeded in doing that would of course lie in whatever WMR 2020 would surpass the half a million mark of downloads its predecessor, the 2018 <laughs> is likely to touch, hopefully soon, just 40,000 less. Shall I then conclude by saying that the proof of the pudding will be in the eating? Shall I say, let us wait and watch that as the IOM, the DG, and Dr. McAuliffe move on to the making of the next edition of the pudding. Sorry, I mean, pardon me, I mean the next edition of the WMR 
222. Bon appétit. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much. For that purpose, I, I, I'm on a diet, but for that purpose, <laughs> I will not be on a diet. <laughs> so we, we will have a, a, a pre-aperitif in the first reactions that uh, <laughs> I would welcome. And first of all, uh, Madam uh, Ambassador, you are welcome, and please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director General. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm humbled to have been invited to speak at this event. I think it is a key opportunity to discuss this very important issue, and I thank the organizers and the participants for your dedication and collaboration on this important, challenging, and very sensitive issue of climate-induced migration and displacement. The report astutely recognizes the challenges of mobility in an increasingly uncertain times. It is remarkable how much of this dialogue has grown across a range of fora and has become increasingly mainstreamed into policy discussions. Yet we, are, we all still have so much to do. But for the Marshall Islands, we are exclusively low-lying, narrow atolls. We have no higher grounds and an average elevation of two meters above sea, sea level. We have nowhere within our nation to turn nowhere ultimately to relocate. And while our population is small, our exclusive economic zone is large, about the size of Mexico. If we couple that with our neighbors of the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republic of Palau, we have a combined zone larger than the size of the continental United States, slightly smaller than Europe. Together, we are something of an ocean bridge spanning the Pacific between Hawaii and the southern edge of the Philippines and South China Sea. How is this discussion even morally acceptable for a low-lying island nation? The fact is, this discussion is not morally acceptable, but it is also very necessary and vital. We have no true international precedent for this possible outcome, a wholesale relocation of one entire nation's population into another. Our political leadership raises deep and fundamental questions underpinning the climate migration issue, at least as applied to a low-lying nation. We presume our inherent right to nationhood, our borders, sovereignty, and resources therein, just as much as with any other member state of the United Nations. I realize much of this and other fora are rightly considering the essential dignity and human rights of displaced persons. But with that, we Marshallese also have a right to statehood. It was a very hard fought battle to independence, and it seems it is one we are still fighting in the face of climate risks. While we define all these issues under the term mixed migration, from our unique perspective, climate change related migration is not only an issue of policy and human rights, but also as a very traditional security issue. There is compelling evidence that the increasing scale, frequency, or death of threat posed by events like droughts or coastal flooding is presently accelerated by climate change. The next one or two decades, one or two decades, and beyond promise to be significantly worse. Different islands and different places within the islands will see impacts on different timelines, but ultimately we will see the same risks threats to our own, our thin fresh line, freshwater lands, food security, marine ecosystems, coral reefs, coastal flooding, and eventually overtopping. We are now at the brink. Each scientific report brings home a more profound and serious expose of imminent risks, threats, and dangers posed by climate change. This would put the entire Marshallese population at risk and most likely result in the forced relocation of our people and the loss of our homeland. Yet climate-driven migration, displacement, or mobility at large scale, or consuming our entire population, our risk our people will need to face in the future. However, we want to remain on our islands. We are absolutely not out of time or getting on the next canoe out of town. But now is the time to act. 
This is the time to build on global cooperation through strong and practical measures to address emissions, not to limit economies, but to limit risks. And perhaps most importantly, to build res resilience adap adaptation across the board. We have to plan, live, learn, and build much differently and with much more benefit to our local communities. These are factors which can dramatically limit or accelerate our future rate of migration. We are taking forward a comprehensive national adaptation plan and building out policies, yet so much more remains to be done to tackle and boost climate resilience and address our wider development gap. We continue to work towards the deline delineation of our coastal boundaries under the Law of the Sea Convention to safeguard our sovereign rights to fisheries and other resources around our islands. If sea level rise is not slowed, these resources may be all we have left. I must add that the Marshallese people already have some unique lessons on migration and displacement. As I hope many of you know, during our status as a UN trust territory, we were host to 67 large-scale nuclear weapons tests between 1946 and 1958. These were equivalent of experiencing, on average, 1.6 Hiroshima-sized shots every day for 12 years. Communities who were relocated during or after testing found that the new islands were not so easily interchangeable with the old ones, in particular food security. Some of our local communities remain in exile and unable to return. Others who have been able to realize some measures of remediation find deep and lingering questions on exactly what is safe. And decades later, we are only starting to piece together our own capacity for policy and science. So this experience has some important lessons for climate-driven migration. Land for us isn't interchangeable. Displacement opens a sort of loss that can never be truly erased. We cannot rewind the clock, nor assume that easy or distant quick policy fixes are even remotely adequate to address true local needs. In petitioning the UN Trusteeship Council to halt the test in 1954, Marshallese leaders informed the UN that if you take away our land, our spir spirits will also go. With so little of it, land has a truly unique place in our traditional social structure. It isn't bought or sold or exchanged, but a good health by all in common, and also through a unique social structure. People belong to the net land and not the way around, other way around. Everyone belongs to somewhere specific, and you can always return. If you lose that connection, you will be lost. What if there is no more land or no more functional, functional land? Then what becomes of us, and not only as a nation or a collective people, but also our own selves? If we leave, there will be no return. What do we become as a culture? For me and earlier generations of Marshallese, the cost of failure is simple. Just 30 years ago, our forefathers fought long and hard for our political independence and for our statehood. Can you imagine having won an independent state only to realize now that your children and grandchildren may see it disappear? It is time that evidence-based analysis and reports like these do not just serve to tell the story of our common demise, but serve as a wake-up call to act. Kumol, thank you very much. Well, um, well, Ambassador, thank you so much for your very impressive testimony. I will now give the floor to the permanent representative of Germany. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Director General. I'm very happy to join here, of course, uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Debram gave us a very strong and emotional message. Um, that I cannot do because we are in a different situation. However, I think it's important to understand that migration and refugees is affecting everybody in one way or the other. Uh, 
There are economic, social effects, effects on human rights, effects on peace and security and stability. And in one way or the other, will uh, have an effect on uh, every country, I think, around the world. In Germany, the topic of migration and refugees is very present in the political debate, both in our political institutions and in society at large. The debate concerns both the situation inside Germany, but also it has a very strong European Union angle. And then, of course, migration and refugees very much also shape the opinions that Germans have from countries where migration comes from. So I think it really affects the, view, the, the, the image that Germans have of our relations with the world outside. The German government is very aware that we need strong international governance and cooperation, strong institutions, global, like IOM and UNHCR, at a regional level, like in the European Union, and of course also domestically. That we need rules that are implemented, and that we also need adequate financing for these institutions. Mr. Director General, much has been achieved in that respect in the past years, notably the two global compacts. But challenges are growing very fast, domestically, regionally, and at a global level. Our institutions need to be strengthened now. Mr. Director General, you have our full support in that endeavor. You want ref to reform the structure of IOM and make it more effective, make it more up-to-date and in line with the situation we are living in now. Also, you have pointed to problems in connection with the financial situation of IOM. We understand your arguments, and we will engage constructively as soon as we get substantial proposals. Now let me turn more specifically to the Migration Report 2020. For us, the report is very, a very important instrument. Therefore, we have supported this year's edition of the World Migration Report, to which IOM's Global Migration Data Ana Analysis, Analysis Center in Berlin has significantly contributed. Reliable data are the foundation of planning and policy design that is based on evidence. But data is not enough. There's a professor for statistics that once said, statistics are like a bikini. They show a lot, but hide the essentials. And uh, they can, of course, easily be misused. That is why the analytical debate is so important. The Global Compact lays the foundation for this debate. The Compact nearly has global support. So let's build on that. And part two of the migration report does just that. The new report in part two looks into the effects of emerging trends, like rapidly growing number of migrants, especially young migrants, and especially the effect it has on females. In crisis situations, Women are often the ones who bear responsibility for accompanying children. Other topics are hugely relevant. Integration efforts, the fate of children in migration contacts, migration governance, contribution of migration, we've just heard it, to society. Germany is concluding, in this respect, bilateral global skills partnerships. The idea is to prepare qualified workers in countries of origin for job vacancies in countries of destination. Ger there are, I want to speak about a risk and an opportunity of this report. The risk is that this is going to be yet one more very useful report 
disappearing in shelves, this time not in shelves, in computers, and uh, that it will have very little effect. And that's a real risk, and we know many of these very good reports. Now the opportunity is, and I think we have to work to make this opportunity happen, that this report will contribute to preventive action, forward-looking action, and have an impact in the real world, changing the lives of the people who are affected. This is what the German government is trying to achieve, and in that spirit, Foreign Minister Maas, the German Foreign Minister, was among the first to send a positive reply to Director General's request for a contribution to the new startup fund of the Global Compact of the GCM. For the ongoing year, Germany will make a contribution of 2 million euros to this fund. Germany's contribution to IOM in general has reached another record sum of more than 130 million US dollars for projects this year, on top of what we are contributing through the European Union. Let me make one comment or one question to, to end. How is this report, or the contents of this report, how are they going to be spread or transported more generally? Is it enough to do it through the internet? Don't we have to transport these messages, not just to the political class, but to civil society, to schools, even to kindergartens, to universities, to the media, to those who are working in the cultural sector, to trade unions and employers. All of these are strongly affected by migration. I believe it is an important task for all of us. It cannot just rely on IOM, but of course IOM has an important role to play. Should we here in Geneva try and launch a campaign? So I think that's a question that is debatable and uh, that we could discuss. How do we go about merchandising the messages that we have in the report? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Those are very important questions and uh, we will look very much look forward to the debate. I would like Mary to take stock of what are our ideas about that and then I will come back. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Director General, and thank you for that raising that question. It's, it's one that we uh, constantly consider. It's one that we um, review continuously, and part of that is looking at the evidence, and looking at the evidence of what's happened with this rather large uh, 2018 report, and trying to innovate and trying to improve. So we have some uh, wonderful interns with us at the moment who have really looked very closely at how 2018 has been used. I would also say in typical IOM fashion, we are a project or an organisation, we also have a concept note that I'm very happy to share with people on a World Migration Report toolkit to enable different streams. We're currently working on a CSO stream with our partners internally, that is uh, civil society okay. organisation stream, sorry. <laughs> there are too many I acronyms. acronyms, I know, too many acronyms. <laughs> Uh, we're working on that within the organisation that is funded uh, through unearmarked contributions, but we're more than happy to share uh, what we are considering and proposing in regards to the media, in regards to educators uh, as well, because we, we recognise, as well as practitioners, we recognise that there is potential and, and we really welcome uh, your comments. What I can let you know about is that uh, we have tracked the 2018 report. We know that the reach is very wide globally, uh, we are up to 460,000 downloads. Uh, we probably won't get to 500,000 because 2020 is now available, of course, so it might take a little while. We have 67 mentions of the World Migration Report 2018 from writers in 26 countries in 11 languages. Uh, English, Spanish, most popular, but there are many other languages that are used. We have 53 mentions from writers in 23 countries. We have 584 citations. And what is in academic literature? 
But what is most inspiring, I think, for our small team is that the World Migration Report 2018 has been used as a fact-checking source. This is particularly important for us. This is in regards to social media tweets that are racist, that are xenophobic in nature. So this is being able to use the evidence, especially the data component in the fronts, to be able to counter some of those elements. Again, I agree with you that I think there is a fair amount of opportunity and I would welcome uh, discussions on how we might be able to take that forward and how we might be able to use the material and the evidence to inform programmatic responses, but especially to inform the discourse, because we know that the discourse is increasingly difficult. It has been for some time. This is trying to create a new discourse through facts, through evidence, empirical evidence, but also a synthesis to show that migration actually is something that has been historical in nature, that is very closely tied to geography, but also very closely tied to geopolitics. So thank you so much for your remarks. Thank you so much. In fact, from my uh, point of view, this kind of uh, reports are extremely important because they build a solid stock of evidence to be at the disposal of the users. But the success of the report depends if the member states take ownership of it. Because even the strategy of communicating the same evidence needs to be adapted to the target public. Uh, the same facts cannot be presented exactly in the same way with different political environments and different uh, perceptions even of the terms that are used in the information. So uh, we do not aspire to have a magic solution to spread worldwide this evidence because we very much rely on the engagement at the national level, at regional level, of key players. And who are the key players? Up from the member states. Mem because this is evidence put at the disposal of our member states to be used by them. Then, of course, we have a challenge from our national offices. is to target the messages to the appetite of the media, classical media, traditional media. We cannot get out of the traditional media. Because today, one important part of our population still links with the subject through the traditional media, whether it is um, newspapers or television or radio. But we have to incorporate in our communication strategy more and more social media. And social media is a new environment when sometimes it's very difficult to provide evidence and reliable evidence in front of a proliferation of fake news exercise all over the world. And uh, social media requires a very fine-tuned approach. And that's what we are asking from our own national offices, is to tailor the message, which is based on this evidence, of course, tailor the message to the kind of subjects that are more often used to distort the narrative in relation to migration. Yes, racist and xenophobic uh, standards are very much widespread, but the way you address them in a, diff in a specific society is different from the way you address them in a different society. So the, we, we provide the source, and it is what it is, a reliable source. But the best use of this source is to fine tune the message to the different target audiences that uh, we want to reach. Of course, the academic world works more or less worldwide with the same kind of standards. Mm -hmm. So the dialogue there is much more easy. The difficulty is not as much and the um, converted audiences <laughs> The ones who know perfectly well what we mean when we use one term or the other, or when we make a comparison between data, that is the easiest part. The difficult part is to translate this evidence into operational tools 
to reach the non-converted, the skepticals, or even the critics, the ones who develop a critical narrative on, uh, on migration. And then there is also a last point I would like to emphasize. The feedback is very important. We, we, this is, requires an, a lot, an, an enormous amount of work. Of course, we are rewarded by the downloads, but that is that only f signals that people have access to what we have done. But there is a second part which is still missing, which is the feedback, which is your criticism. What have we presented that you did not consider sufficiently clear? What were the aspects? of the evidence that we have collected that uh, are, in your views, incomplete and that we should broaden the scope of the data that we collect and the perspectives of the analysis that we make on the basis of the data that we have collected. That's the only way of, of turning this report in a useful tool to be used by all stakeholders in the future, whether it is the civil society, NGOs, uh, institutional, international organizations, or state and local uh, level institutions. So that's my plea. It's yours. Please use it. Please use it. And give us your feedback. Even if it is a critical feedback, that will help us in improving the quality of the 2022 pudding. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's because we are already on uh, lunchtime. Not pudding product, <laughs> but definitely now we can have lunch, I think. So I would like to thank you very much, ambassadors, for your presentations. Thank you uh, to the co-editors for the work. And uh, uh, I wish you a very pleasant lunch. And we will be back to the year at uh, 3 o'clock, if I'm not wrong. Yes, at 3 o'clock. Thank you so much, and have a nice lunch.